the family tree. Sisters, mothers, brothers, fathers. Sisters, mothers, brothers, fathers. No sons or daughters. That's kind of weird. Because then they'd be somebody else's sister, mother, fathers, brothers. And to us, that's perfectly normal to look at a family tree and see these different relationships. And we've gotten away from it because, I mean, we have a fear of going too far with things. We do. We always do. Instead of no realizing that we have a fear of going too far, we just kind of throw the whole thing out. We're like, oh no, there's no family relationships within the church. And the truth is, it's not how it really works. Tonight meeting with the elders, it's one of those things that you kind of figure out that it's kind of nice. Because you, you realize who you are for a second. You, you sit there with the elders and you're just like, yeah, you're the friend for all, but I'm the one who's just like, I'm confused. Can you help me out? Um, and I love it. And I understand that I am supposed to say the parental role, right? Be right? Because no one ever has, no one has a father in this room. No one has a father in this room. Right? Because when you call up, I even want to let my son say it. I just want you to know that. He calls me brother. No kidding. <laughs> what? You didn't know that? It says this whole relationship thing, and I used to be so foreign to all of this that I seriously have my son call me brother. Because I don't care how you translate a word. It doesn't change the meaning any. I don't have him call him his dad. I don't. I don't have him call me his father. I don't have him call me anything but brother. And that's probably why we call each other brother, and everybody's like... And I did this when we were in liberal and some lady finally asked if Shana was our mom. <laughs> it made sense. Uh... But today we are in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And I want you to catch on to the imagery. And the imagery is that of a family tree. <clears throat> Especially like when there's gender changes in the middle of a story. And you have, you have to realize Paul used, does just that. He begins talking to them, and obviously, he's very caring and very concerned about them. So he's going to use imagery, family imagery, because he's relating to them as children. But tonight we are in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, starting in verse 1. For you yourselves know brothers. There you go. There's my brother term I like. For you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain. But though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. For our appeal does not spring from error or impunity or any attempt to deceive. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not to please man, but to please God who tested our hearts. For we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor the pretext for greed, God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, like a mother taking care of her own children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves. Because you have become very dear to us. This isn't the only occasion where we see this. It says this, Do not revoke, you an older man, but encourage him as you would a father, and older women as mothers. We've gotten away from this, and it's not positive. Because in any family, there's a natural desire for needing someone. I was always taught to use these words. They're not unbiblical, but they're not necessarily biblical. You have a Paul, and you're a Paul. You have a Timothy, and you're a Timothy. Meaning that we weren't allowed to say spiritual fathers. Okay. We weren't allowed to say spiritual sons. So what we would say was, I am Paul. And all, it's, it's one of those concepts that we need. You need someone in this church who you 
can look up to because at some point you're going to need somebody to look up. That may or may not be the elders. It could be Brenda. It could be Terry. And that's not a problem. As long as you have somebody and you understand in a family it's set up so that you have someone who maybe it's just like them at this point and he, he needs that gentle approach of being a mother to them. But he continues with this thought and he'll go through most of the relationships. He continues in verse 9. For you remember, brothers, our labor and tool, how we worked night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you, while we proclaim to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct towards you believers. For you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. This is where I didn't like it. I don't like any passage where it calls anyone teacher or father, except for Jesus. I'm okay with it with Jesus. But every other time Jesus does it, I get uncomfortable. When he talks to Nicodemus and he says, you're a teacher of Israel, and it's like, you can't say that. No one's a teacher. You've said that before. I, I'm, I'm uncomfortable. And somebody tricked me the other day and asked me about my wife, what her job was, what she was, you know, trying to get, you know, her occupation, and I slipped. I did. I said, she's a teacher. And he laughed at me. Because he knows where I come from. And he goes, you called your wife a teacher, but you can't call anybody else a teacher. Yeah, that does seem a little weird, but you get the point. And what I do is I go back to this passage, and this is Christ, and he says to us, but you are not to be called rabbi, teacher. For you have one teacher, and you are all brothers. And call no man your father on earth. For you have one father who is in heaven. Neither be called instructor, for you have one instructor, the Christ. And I would go to this, and this is my token verse, and I could have sworn that it was wrong to call my parental male person anything. I refer to my parents because it's easier than saying my male parent. Because that's just cheating is all it is. I'm not getting around it, I'm just cheating. And what I'd do is, I'd be like, well... Papa, I'm okay with that term. Well, that's actually the Latin, which still means father. Okay. Um, dad. I don't even know how to say that one right. Dad. Okay, I'm slightly comfortable with it. And what I was doing was I wasn't going away from this word. I was just, as long as it didn't match the King James English, I thought it was okay. Because most of us will admit we have a male parent and call him by a name. I wasn't going to call him by his first name. He's a very rough man. He would win that fight. But it's, the truth is that I have struggled with this so long. And finally somebody showed me the scriptures that should have made me uncomfortable. Philemon, verse 10. Only one chapter. I appeal to you for my child in this list, whose father I became in my imprisonment. I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. It's weird how it will go to that one verse that Christ said, and instead of leaving it in the context, because most of us are not afraid of terms like Sunday school teacher. I say it all the time. I'll say, who's the Sunday school teacher? Who's the Wednesday night teacher? Who's the teacher? Morris the teacher. Is that she a teacher? I, I don't even think anything about it, but yet in that same passage about fathers, it's talking about don't be called teachers. And what we've done is we've made this really strong case that makes for awkward sentences, and that's all it does. He's talking to a very specific group there. He's talking about the Pharisees, and he's talking about them falsely using names. The fact that Paul calls himself a spiritual father. Talk about making me uncomfortable as extreme as possible. Because he's not saying that he gave birth to them. He's not declaring that. He says, became a father in Christ Jesus. One of those where we get uncomfortable, but the fact is, the church still looks like a family. 
But he continues with this thought. Verse 13. And we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which at work is at work in you believers. For you brothers became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus, that ye are in Judea. For you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews, who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets, and drove us out and displeased God and opposed all mankind by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they might be saved. So as always to fill up the measure of their sins, but wrath has come upon them at last. I love it. What he's done is he has switched modes. He's still Paul. The person we are talking about was the spiritual mother, Paul. The one who said he's a spiritual father, that was Paul again. The one that now switches and says he's the brother, that's still Paul. And what he does is he's switching what he's talking about. And what is he talking about here? A shared experience. And there is a sense when we're all brothers and sisters. And that's our shared experience. Because that's what he's going to. He's talking about how they're suffering just the way he suffered. Imitate us. Be like us. And a sense of brotherhood. In which we do need to share. Because it's not always about me looking to the elders. Sometimes it's a shared experience with them. You know. Me and Ray may hang out in a parking lot until we look about the same color. Have our beautiful red faces on and I, at that point we're not looking at each other like anything. I'm not really looking up to him, I mean, except for physically. And he's looking down on me, but not, you know, spiritually. And so what we're doing is we're just having a shared experience that way. And I may hang out with a spiritual mother of mine. But if we're working together, we're not going to be thinking, you know, well, you're leading me. She doesn't need to tell me how to chop butter. She doesn't need to tell me how to do turn on an oven. But yet, when we have those relationships, they switch. They switch because some of those relationships need to be fostered in a sense of shared. Because you can get the impression that you are someone's fault. You, you are teaching someone. You are guiding someone. But he's no less teaching in this because he's calling them to imitate. But let's talk about Christ's way of teaching. Christ's way of teaching is give them something really hard. Get them confused. Get them really confused. Break it down. They kind of got it. And then show it to them. And what it is is you should always have sons. You should have daughters. You have people that are looking up to you, and you should. And you should be trying to train up the younger ones. You should be trying to teach them. You should be trying to show them what's right. But I use that word very specifically at the end. Show. I'm not saying just gripe at them. Show them things. If you're like, if you look at this generation and you say there's a problem here, are you showing it? Are you doing the three-step teaching method? Where you tell them something that's just... Then you break it down for them. Kind of got it. And then you show them. And he continues. And I, and I love this last one. This is, it's, it's the beauty of teaching others and taking others under our wing. Verse 17. But since we were torn away from you brothers for a short time in person, not in heart... We endeavored the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face because we wanted to come to you. I call again and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus that is coming? Is it not you? For you are our glory and joy. We can talk about the importance of teachers and all that. But the fact is, this is one of those things where if you miss out doing this, you miss out. It's not as though being a teacher to someone and taking someone under your wing just benefits them. It benefits you. I, my favorite is when I'm trying to teach something and then I have to go home and apologize to my wife. 
I, d I hate premarital counseling because I need it. And, and I'm sitting there and I'm going, no, 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 you continuously, and we're breaking down 1 Corinthians 13, and then I'm like, yeah, I remember what I did last night. That didn't fit really good. And, and through that relationship, I'm being built up. Through that relationship, I'm questioning my own self. There's no pressure because I'm the teacher. But I'm going teaching others, and then I'm able to take what I'm teaching others and improve my life. And you always hear this lovely phrase in church, and, and I hate it because I was part of this generation that y'all crashed today. Yeah, we always be like, the terrible generation, and then it was Y, and then it's 14 2K, and then it's Millennials, and then it's blah, blah, blah. You'll give them a new name every year. Z, I thought we should start with A after Z, but they didn't like that. And so they have these names, and you look at it and you say, aren't they a terrible generation? Yep. What? Hey, what we do? And, and I say, I hate it because... I just don't see why you're admitting to it. I don't know why you would admit that the generation you created is terrible. I, I wouldn't do it out of pride and go, oh, I can't believe they're doing that. Yeah, you created that. My generation was not raised by themselves. They were raised by wolves. <laughs> he all raised them. And the fact is, I don't care if you have born a child, if you have adopted a child, and then say you're excluded. That doesn't work either. You can be a teenager, and there's little kids who think you're amazing because you're a teenager. You can be a 90 year old woman, and there's young ladies just trying to figure out things that you're like, yeah, I figured that out 50 years ago. Okay, we'll teach. Well, why don't women know how to do this? I don't know. Did you ever teach one how to do that? I always heard that in school. At Free Garden, the big thing was women can't cook anymore. Okay. Did you ever teach one how to cook? I've never tried to teach a woman how to cook, but a woman's never tried to teach me how to cook. And all these things that we want from this generation. We, we put on them and we say, have I ever tried? They don't get how to have strong bonded relationships. I remember back in the good old days when we did such and such. And you never taught anyone how to do that? You never taught any of that? It didn't seem like a good idea? And the idea is that we are a family. And in a family, some need to step up and be mothers and fathers. Because there's, there's a whole lot of knowledge that just kind of goes to waste. Because guess what? You don't have that goofy title that I don't even know what mine is. I told you I'll be, I'll be the glorified redneck. That was my favorite title. And the reason I said that is because I don't have one. I just change it. I look for a new scripture and then I steal that scripture for that week and then that's what I am that week. And you know what my title means? As much as I change it, it's pointless. Because most of the best teaching y'all are going to get in your life is not going to happen in these seats. If you want to ask me how to live the Christian life, I'm not going to tell you about a sermon I heard. I'll tell you about a sermon I saw. This morning's sermon was stolen. I hope you know. Nobody preached it because I don't still preach sermons because I don't like them. But this man showed me a sermon. In the middle of his, I don't know what you would call it, preaching, I guess. He's doing this preaching thing. And this little girl, tiny little thing. I think she's like five, I'm pretty sure. But she's really small for her. She comes up in the middle of this very serious time, right? This is a serious church. A whole lot crazier than this. They were serious. And in the middle of this series, this little girl runs up to him. And he's got everything written down he's going to do. And he stops, kind of kneels down and hugs him. 
I really don't know what the sermon is about. I don't care, don't remember. It's all right. But I remember what that sermon was about. It was about in the middle of all of that. He was still a spiritual father to this little girl who just needed a hug. She crushed her finger in a knife. And, oh, I don't cry at sermons. That was overwhelming. And if we look at this tree and we consider the church along these lines, we'll get away from a lot of our concepts. Because we need mothers in the church. We need fathers in the church. We need brothers and sisters in the church. We need sons and daughters in the church. We need all these different things in this church and we need all these different relationships simultaneously. And if we have all those relationships, then it doesn't become, look at this generation. Would you honestly say that about your own kids? Look at them. Did you see what they're doing? I'll admit my son does terrible things. He learns at home. And he does. I've got bad habits, and he's learned those before he could learn the others. I wish children only learned the good habits, but they don't. They pick up crazy things you say. I say bloody. I mean it as the British terrible word. He walks around going bloody. His teacher thinks it's a little problem. Your son is obsessed with blood. <laughs> Sorry. It's a slip. I still have that one. But I don't look at him and go how terrible it is. I say, how can I be the best father to him I can? Because there's a bunch of y'all who are parents to my kid. Not me. I don't think he picks up after y'all and me. He respects that giant. Have you seen the giant? I'm not kidding. It's my son's work. Have you seen that giant at church and he leads prayers sometimes and he, he's up there at front sometimes? And this is you, right, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, I saw a giant at church. There are a few of them. <laughs> Take them out with stones. <laughs> But he doesn't, he's, he's talking about you, and I'm just like, that's beautiful. And he's talking about the people that he looks up to. He's talking about teachers and preachers and things that he sees and the people he runs into. And he doesn't go, well, you're my father because your wife gave birth to me. You're not. He doesn't make that distinction. He has a bunch of parents in the church. And we teach them that. We say, you always look up to your elders. Because they're going to. Win. And we can talk about peer pressure, and we can talk about all those different things, and none of those are bad things. Those are all good. Peer pressure is great. You have no idea how useful peer pressure is. You don't think that giant can walk up to my son and ask him to do something? He's like, uh-huh. <laughs> Whatever you just said. Good idea. Peer pressure at work. And if we took it more seriously about the last commandment being more than just, we would say, go into all the world and do what? Make what? Make disciples. That did not say a lot of things we've inserted in that sentence. It said, go make disciples. Disciples are more than just someone who kind of knows some stuff and in a week they may not be a Christian. Making disciples is about, I don't know, maybe you're good at something. I've always wanted Rachel to teach me how to write cards so the words make sense in order. Because I'm not good at it. I'll write cards, but the people who actually want to respond to my cards go, what did this mean? Glad you appreciated me sending you a card. And yet, it, that is something very simple, but the thing is, it's not something we know. It's not something I've ever been taught is how to write a card. Rosemary helped me address a card. Y'all have thought mail was new to me. Right, you, the addressee goes in the middle. I still have to think back and go, like, Rosemary said the addressee goes in the middle. Okay. I, I've messed up some envelopes and had to start over, but she taught me. And that's more what Christianity is about. It's about 
I'm really good at prayer. Let me teach you about prayer. I'm really good at sending out cards. Let me teach you about that. I I think I have this marriage thing figured out. Please, if you are that one, please come talk to me. I still think it's a mystery. I'm like, the Trinity seems easier than marriage. I get the whole three and one, but two and one getting along. Because at the end, what's he saying? There is glory and his joy. Because that's what a church should be giving us. And it shouldn't be about lines and thanksgiving and everyone hating each other. It should be about relating to each other like that. Relating to each other at worst as brother and sister. Some of us, we need to be looking more as parental figures and being like, what can I learn from you? And some of you need to be looking at the little ones around you and saying, what can I teach you? There's a million things I don't know about Christianity and I'd love to learn them. from somebody who is willing to get some more glory and some more joy. So we have this simple teaching. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin, for one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. There's that simple teaching. I told you about Christ's three-step process. There's that. Now I've got some questions. There's that. Now let me talk to you and explain this in a way that makes it a little bit clearer. Because honestly, you go out into the world and you start talking about being baptized into his death, and they're just like, I gotta die. You wanna kill me? No, no, I mean, yeah, you, you are supposed to die, but not really. And you can see how there's, there's this hard teaching of Scripture, and it's gonna take you breaking down a little bit and teaching. And then you know what's gotta happen? That they too might walk in newness of life. We gotta demonstrate that in life. So tonight we have an invitation, an invitation to respond to this gospel message. This gospel message of death into life. This gospel message of faith in Christ and confession of Him and repentance of our wickedness. This death into life. This new life that we then live, we have that invitation. We also have the invitation. Some, some of us aren't living new. We don't live a new life. We live like we did before we ever came here. Or some of us just need prayers because we're a family. Or there's some who may need to submit to the eldership here. If any of those apply to you, we ask that you come as we stand and as we sing. What can wash away?